Hi, I'm Rhett Talbot, and welcome to the Beyond Data podcast. We live in a world of big data where it is sometimes surprising to learn that we don't have, or at least don't have ready access to, the information necessary to really understand a thing, to make important decisions based on something more concrete than anecdote and alternative facts. Beyond Data is a new science podcast tackling issues that are not as data-centric as we might initially think, issues that require us to go beyond the data. As a freelance journalist who has covered fisheries at the intersection of science and sustainability for the past decade, I find my ears perking up every time I hear Blue Apron's sponsorship message on podcasts to which I listen or during national public radio broadcasts. Marketing that talks about how the company is working working with with leading sustainability experts to develop higher standards for food. So you can be sure you're getting higher quality ingredients that are also better for the earth. Since my wife and I are fortunate to live on the coast of Maine with access to plenty of fresh, sustainable seafood, and since we generally cook from scratch, I didn't have a personal reason to dig any deeper into Blue Apron or the phenomena of meal kit delivery services. But professionally speaking, my interest was piqued, and I kept hearing those ads. Support for this NPR podcast and the following message come from Blue Apron. Blue Apron partners with sustainable farms, fisheries, and ranchers to bring you all the ingredients you need to create incredible home-cooked meals. When it comes to seafood, there are many challenges. Throughout my reporting, I've come to appreciate that a disproportionate number of those challenges can be traced back to how seafood makes its way from the water to the consumer. And based on Blue Apron's marketing approach, it seemed like the company was taking those supply chain issues head on. So one night I sat down and typed Blue Apron into my web browser to take a deeper look into how exactly the company was sourcing its seafood. Call it sea to table or dock to dish, a transparent, traceable supply chain is the pescatarian's version of farm to table. Just as the farm to table movement has gained steam with many consumers who are increasingly interested in where their food originates, so too has at least a desire to know more about one's seafood. The problem is that unlike much of the rest of the food industry, the seafood sector has been very slow to evolve. Seafood. It's, it's still the same thing it was 50 years ago. It's a deeply commoditized industry that hasn't really had a lot of innovation. That's Ken Ploss, CEO of Portland, Oregon-based Fish People Seafood. While Fish People is not a meal kit delivery service per se, at least two meal kit delivery services, one of which we tried while researching this episode, source at least some of their seafood from Fish People. The company's goal is to create a traceable and transparent supply chain that is, in industry speak, vertically integrated. Put another way, Ken can tell me about the boat, the gear, and the fisher that landed that Pacific cod, which showed up in my Sunbasket meal kit. Even better, Fish People is passing that story along to me as the consumer by giving me a code printed on the packaging that allows me to go online and learn more about the fishery from which this cod was sourced. For example, I now know this fish was caught by fishers on either the FV Courageous or the FV Baranoff on Alaska's Bering Sea. I know what these boats look like, and I know the fishery is certified by the Marine Stewardship Council and that Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch rates this fish best choice. More on these certifications and ratings later in the episode. Giving the consumer all this information fits in with what Ken calls a consumer-first company which also means that Ken realizes that he has to acknowledge and address a multitude of issues consumers, especially American consumers, have with seafood. At the heart of it, consumers, they want more clean proteins, yet they're very fearful of, of, of seafood, how, uh, how hard it is to find seafood you trust, whether that's through fraud or through heavy metals or through um, sources that uh, that don't don't provide that clean, healthy fish. Whether they're adding preservatives or it's genetically modified, they have they have many reasons to not be um, trustful. And even for consumers who may not be so concerned with seafood fraud or possible health risks associated with consuming some seafood, there is one other big fear that dominates Americans' relationship with seafood. It's hard to prepare. It's very easy to screw up and. When you put that together, it creates a situation where the majority of consumers today buy seafood in in the food service sector, restaurants and uh, colleges, universities, um, 
and don't cook it in their home. It's the inverse of almost every other food category. Ken's right. The data show that Americans don't eat seafood at home nearly as much as they eat it out. According to a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration report, U.S. consumers spend an estimated $63.4 billion at food service establishments like restaurants in 2016. During that same time, they spent just $29.8 billion, less than half, in retail sales for home consumption. This dichotomy is one with which I'm quite familiar, and while my role is as a journalist, not an advocate, I can't help but implore people to cook more seafood at home for a host of reasons ranging from health benefits to socioeconomic and environmental concerns. We'll get into some of those in a bit. This question of how to encourage more seafood consumption at home is one with which the seafood industry has been grappling for years. Leading chefs like Rick Moonen, I heard one person refer to him as the godfather of seafood sustainability at North America's largest seafood trade show a couple years ago, they coax and conjole home cooks to dive in. They tell home cooks, well, here's how Rick put it while speaking to Share Care. In my research, why people don't cook seafood at home as often, I think, is they're just afraid of it. They see it as this foreign creature. You know, they're afraid to overcook it. And I tell people, just play with it. You know, probe with it. You know, you know how to cook a steak. People are comfortable cooking a steak at home. You know, if you can cook an egg, you know what protein looks like when it changes colors. You crack an egg, you put it into a, a pan, and that clear egg white starts to slowly turn opaque. And it gets to a, you know, a brighter white color. Well, that's what protein does. So once you understand that it's that simple, you know, take seafood at home cooks quicker, it's better for you, you know, and, and, just, and just have fun with it. In conjunction with thought leaders like Rick, encouraging home chefs to play with seafood in their kitchens, the industry has responded by attempting to physically remove barriers by making seafood friendlier. Take a look, for example, at the explosion of marinated, packaged, and prepared seafood offerings that now dominate the seafood selection at so many grocery stores. Still, however, Americans seem resistant. Why is that? Some industry observers believe meal kit delivery companies that offer seafood are poised to turn this dynamic around and get more people cooking and ultimately eating seafood at home. This seems to square with what many of the meal kit delivery services with whom I spoke for this episode told me. Many even expressed surprise at how well their seafood offerings are selling, given what the data show about Americans' willingness to cook and eat fish at home. Ken Ploss again. When you look at uh, those meal kit companies, many are over-indexing in seafood relative to uh, other um, anywhere else in the spectrum. Uh, Sunbasket, one of our partners, for example, I, I think they had relayed back that of their top 10 items, their salmon was one of their top items, if not the top item. And that's pretty incredible considering that um, seafood is consumed um, with, you know, at such a low level relative to beef or, or chicken or other, other protein substitutes. Can meal kit companies turn the tide when it comes to getting Americans to eat more seafood? Monica Jane, founder of Fish 2.0, thinks so. And she thinks that has a lot to do with the growing awareness of sustainable seafood. I see that meal kits help sustainable seafood and sustainable seafood helps meal kits. Fish 2.0 is on the cutting edge of innovation in the seafood sector by seeking to build connections between innovative startup businesses and potential investors through a biannual competition. Monica agrees with Ken that there are serious barriers getting in the way of more Americans cooking seafood at home, and she thinks meal kit delivery services that offer seafood could be a way to break down many of those barriers. It comes with information on how to cook it, and it, it kind of breaks through the, barrier, the reluctance barrier that many people have of trying a new species. As people feel like often they'll go to the store and they'll say, I've never cooked that, I don't know how to cook it, or I don't know what to cook that with. And the meal kit kind of breaks through those barriers. And that's going to be, that's, that's really important for U.S. consumers, especially because in the U.S. We have, we've had lower sea, seafood consumption than in most other nations. And it's mainly because of that barrier. People don't know how to cook it, so they eat seafood when they're out at restaurants. And they don't want to try new species because they don't know how, either they don't know how to prepare them or they don't know, like, how will it taste with this sauce or with this side dish that I always prepare. So the meal kit is great. 
So meal kit companies are great because they appear to be targeting and breaking down one of the biggest barriers to people cooking and eating seafood in their homes. Yay meal kits. But where does this fit into the bigger picture of sea to table within the larger context of our relationship to food in general? I, I think meal kit companies are kind of playing in to a change in the U.S. food market overall, which is that, as we all know, we all want now we all want food fresh. We want it to be high quality. We want it to be rich in information, and we want it to come to my to our house. <laughs> We don't want to go shopping for it anymore. Right. And we also, we want to know where it came from. And that's not just seafood, it's every food. And on top of that, it has to taste great or we're not going to have any, you know, all the rest doesn't matter. And I feel like sustainable seafood kind of hits all those buttons because the supply chains for sustainable seafood are often shorter. And when the supply chain is shorter, it means that the products of those supply chains are often fresher. They're, they've been handled less, so they're often better quality. And then on top of it, because of this, to be truly sustainable, you have to know where that product came from. Then it comes with information on where it was fished or farmed. So it kind of hits all the buttons. And this brings me back to Blue Apron and those ads I kept hearing. Ads that promised seafood that was sourced in such a way that it was good for me and for the earth. So you'll recall that I sat down on my computer one night and typed Blue Apron into my browser. I was thinking this would be a great story for a journalist who covers fisheries at the intersection of science and sustainability. Here was a company, after all, that was tackling some of the biggest barriers to home cooking and consumption of seafood in a way that actually appeared to be working. They were disrupting and revolutionizing a broken food system and giving consumers what they wanted, when and where they wanted it. And sustainability was at the heart of it all. All this online research soon meant that my Facebook feed was filled with ads for meal kit delivery service companies, and I was pleasantly surprised that while some focused almost exclusively on health benefits, others, like Blue Apron, put sustainability front and center. This was good, but was it too good? Okay, so here we are on Facebook, and I'm scrolling through my feed, and oh, there we are. It doesn't take long to find a meal service delivery company sponsored ad in my Facebook feed, given all the research I've been doing recently on meal kit delivery services online. Uh, this one's for Blue Apron. It says Blue Apron sponsored. Uh, try us out and get $30 off your first order by visiting and it gives the URL. And then it says what it says pretty much on the vast majority of these uh, Blue Apron ads that I've seen. It's got three bullet points. Uh, what's inside your delivery? Bullet point one, farm fresh seasonal produce. Bullet point two, premium meats with no added hormones. And, and most interesting to me, bullet point three, 100% sustainable seafood. Why the sad trumpet? If you followed any of my writing on fisheries and sustainability, you've probably heard me say something like, sustainability must always be seen as a journey, not a destination. 100% sustainable seafood sounds like a destination to me, like the train has arrived at the station and it's time to get off. For many who work in the sustainable seafood space, that's a problem with any business that's claiming they have achieved sustainability. Once you've arrived, why would you get back on the train? Uh, you know, by calling something sustainable, you drop that will to continue to improve it. So you can go, you can take the most sustainable food production system, and I guarantee you there's ways to go out and make it better. Michael Telusti is Associate Professor of Sustainability and Food Solutions at the University of Massachusetts at Boston School for the Environment. Before that, he was Director of Ocean Sustainability Science at the New England Aquarium. Michael knows his way around the sustainable seafood space, and while he's inclined to speak big picture, he knows what Blue Apron means when they claim 100% sustainable seafood. So that 100% sustainable is shorthand for <clears throat> we have a sourcing policy and 100 percent of the stuff we source is in alignment with our policy so what is that policy to answer that question i reached out to blue apron to confirm what i found on the website and to ask a few follow-up questions and then i reached out again and again 
and again. And, well, you get the point. For a month, I repeatedly emailed the official press email address. I called every number I could find. I chatted online with customer service folks who promised to have someone get back in touch with me. And finally, I resorted to calling the customer service line in order to try to get any information at all. Thanks for calling Blue Apron. Please note that all calls may be recorded or monitored for quality assurance and training I should mention that by this point, I had become a customer of Blue Apron and several other meal kit delivery services. So while I was calling as a journalist, I was also calling as a customer. While I waited, I scrolled through the information available on the Blue Apron website again. I knew that like fish people, Blue Apron states, quote, sustainable seafood recommended by Seafood Watch, end quote, on its Our Vision page of the website. From the ads, I knew that they say they partner with fisheries. While there is a lot of talk about changing the food system on the Our Vision page, there is very little specific to seafood, which struck me as odd, given that they are the meal kit delivery service that makes the boldest claim about their seafood and puts that claim front and center in so much of their marketing. While I continued to wait, I popped over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch program website and confirmed that Blue Apron is indeed a business partner with the Seafood Watch program. Seafood Watch business partners make a commitment to sell only environmentally responsible seafood. Generally, seafood rated by Seafood Watch is best choice or good alternative, and never avoid. I went back to the Blue Apron page, where near the bottom of the page I found a link for suppliers. Of the six partners profiled on the suppliers page, none were suppliers of seafood. For your patience. We're currently experiencing high call volumes and apologize for the wait. If you'd like our next available team member to call you back, press 1 at any time. Otherwise, I then hopped over to the Help and FAQs page and typed seafood into the search box. Bingo. The first result was, quote, what are your seafood standards, end quote. And here's what it says. Sustainable fishing is critical to protect the Earth's natural supply of seafood. We partner with Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, a highly respected nonprofit organization recognized as an authority on seafood sustainability and only source seafood that is rated best choice, good alternative, or recommended by Seafood Watch. A company offloading its sustainability policy onto a third party like Seafood Watch is not terribly unusual, but it does have its own additional set of challenges, and ultimately, it makes it easier for a company to rest on the laurels of a sustainability claim like 100% sustainable seafood, rather than constantly being out there and innovating. I have no idea if this is the case with Blue Apron or not, because the company never responded to any of my inquiries. Even the customer service agent who eventually answered the phone Well, let me just fast forward to that. Thank you for calling Blue Apron Customer Experience. This is Leslie. How may I help you? Hi, how are you today? All right, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, thanks. Um, My name is Rhett Talbot, and I'm a journalist calling from the Beyond Data podcast. Uh, We're recording an episode on how meal kit companies like Blue Apron are influencing um, the sustainable seafood space. And I was hoping that you might be able to answer a few basic questions about uh, Blue Apron seafood for me. Okay. Um, Can I ask you to hold on for a moment? Sure. Thank you. A couple minutes later, Leslie came back. And while I certainly appreciate her position and why she would be unwilling to answer some basic questions about the company's seafood for broadcast, I was still disappointed. Hello? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, Thank you for your patience. Sure. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, this is the customer experience line. Um, I don't really have that type of information. I can give you the email address um, for that type of information for uh, press releases. Um, Um, I've actually actually been reaching out to the media relations team for almost a month now, and I haven't gotten any response. So since I'm also a customer, I thought I could just (laughs) maybe call you. Ah, okay. That would explain a lot. Um, well, actually, I I don't really have this type of information. Can I get your information, please? Your name uh, again, please? Sure, that would be great. My name is Rhett. Nobody Martin. ever did get back in touch with me. But hey, Blue Apron, if you're listening, it sounds like you might have a great story to tell about your sustainable seafood, and you're welcome on the Beyond Data podcast anytime. Just give me a call at 207 370 one five seven five. Again, that's two zero seven three seven zero one five seven five, and we can set up a time to talk. 
So with Blue Apron, the company that got me thinking about the whole meal kit delivery services and sustainable seafood thing in the first place, refusing to speak to me on or off the record, I decided to head into the kitchen with Chef Max Miller and see how a professional chef, known for his innovative and thoughtful approach to cooking, would fare with a Blue Apron seafood recipe. Our Blue Apron meal kit was not the first meal kit to arrive but it was the one that coincided with a free morning for Chef Max. My wife Karen, who is a scientific illustrator best known for her work with fishes, yeah, we're a pretty fishy household, Karen and I unboxed the Blue Apron meal kit the night before. First ever Blue Apron box, and uh, what do you think of the box? Um, I haven't really looked at it. Nice! It says, food is better when you start from scratch. And it's, it's a two-color... Thing. There's a picture of a farmer um, plowing his field. There's a picture of a fisherman on a... What kind of boat is that? Fishing boat. Is that a fishing boat? That's supposed to be... Okay. Um, with fish jumping around him, he's caught one of them. Hook and line. Hook and line, yep. yes. Yep. As we open the box, allow me to briefly touch on the question of packaging. Of all the criticisms levied at meal kit delivery services, excessive packaging is by far the most pervasive. I'm not going to get into a lengthy analysis here, as that's been done elsewhere, but it's worth pointing out that restaurants and grocery stores are responsible for a phenomenal amount of packaging waste and food waste. Of course, the average consumer doesn't see this waste like he or she sees the detritus left behind after a meal kit has been unpacked, but it's worth considering the big picture especially when the data do show that meal kits generally produce less food waste overall. Okay, on with the unboxing. So on the top, we've got two recipe cards. And I've heard a lot about these recipe cards. Um, so we've got our, we've got two. We, we got, so in Blue Apron, this was interesting because um, in, as part of this project, we became customers at many different meal uh, kit delivery services. And, um, and Blue Apron actually was the most challenging one of the ones we chose to actually get seafood delivered. In fact, we had to skip the first week in order to just get to a week where we could have seafood come. Or maybe there was a salmon in the first week, but we already had salmon in the other ones. Um, and so, um, so uh, all the other ones that we've ordered from, we've been able to get multiple seafood yes. uh, options yep. in any given week. With Blue Apron... This week, there was only one seafood option, and it was the barramundi. Um, so it's barramundi and mixed mushrooms. We also have the vegetable pad thai, which we're not going to talk about tonight, so I'm going to put that recipe card away. But, um, but we have the barramundi and mixed mushrooms. And barramundi is a really fascinating story. It's a story that I've, um, on which I've reported in the past, um, and uh, I can link to some of those articles. Um, but it'll be interesting. I've actually never cooked with barramundi. I've just, I haven't either. I've just written about it, and I've interviewed the company that, that, um, that farms this fish. Yep. Um, it is a farmed fish. So, and I'm wondering if anywhere in here it tells us it's a farmed fish. It doesn't look like, at least on the recipe card, it doesn't look like there's anything here that's going to tell me that this fish is farmed. It just says there are two skin-on barramundi fillets. What does it say on the back? And that's just the instructions. Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't know. I was expecting to see some sustainability information on the, on the recipe card, but maybe that was just my bad. Right. Um, I want to take a moment here to point out that Karen and I are probably not the typical meal kit delivery service customers. Although we'd like to think that people like us, people who want to know more about the origins and sustainability of their food, are an important subset of that customer base. As such, we fully appreciate that our expectations regarding transparent supply chains and point-of-origin information are more about us than they are about a company like Blue Apron or its sourcing policies. Having said that, some more sustainability or sourcing information up front in the box would have been really appealing to us. So the way it works with most of these meal kit companies is that the top of the box has the non-protein ingredients, and then there is a cardboard panel with some form of ice pack beneath, and that's where the protein, in our case, barramundi, is packed. All right, and now, this is what we've all been waiting for. This is the, oh, and also there's some more scallions. Maybe they just fell down there between the ice. But this is what we were really waiting for. And this actually is going to tell us this is the information we wanted. So barramundi. 
We hope it's the information. Sustain. Yeah. Well, we wanted to know if they're going to talk about sustainability. Yes, How they're yes, going to yes. talk about it. Barramundi sustainably sourced from our family of trusted fisheries, and the brand is anchored in. And it says, um, um, Barramundi, a premium variety of sea bass. Barramundi calls the waters of the Pacific home, prized by chefs around the world for its sweet, buttery flavor and delicate, delicately flaky texture. It's perfect for baking, grilling, and searing. And then it says, our standards we source from sustainable fisheries to bring you the best seafood raised in open ocean waters. Australis Barramundi is recommended by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, a nonprofit recognized globally for its commitment to ocean conservation and education. This is, uh, this is, uh, I, this is my podcast. I can say whatever I want. Um, this is, this is, this is pretty controversial. Like this is, they're, they're, they're going out of their way. I feel like to, to not say that this is a farmed fish. So is it, I mean, it says raised in, so these are maritime Raised in open ocean waters, right. yeah. But and, and it does seem And like. it's, it's an amazing story. I mean, they do have, this mm. company is doing some incredible things. And I've interviewed um, the principals at this company in the past, and I've written several articles about them. Um, the ones do- who've... who've- Produce the bare minimum. Yes, yes, and they're doing some not incre- anchored in. Not anchored in. No, I don't. I have no idea what anchored in is, and I'm surprised that, with the exception of um, Australis Barramundi, sort of in the buried in the description, that that's the only way you'd even be able to trace it back to that. And probably most people wouldn't know to do that. After the unboxing, I learned that anchored in is a trademark of Blue Apron, and it seems that most, if not all, of the Blue Apron seafood is shipped under the anchored in label. Personally, I feel like Blue Apron is missing a huge opportunity here. You'll recall that the Pacific Cod that arrived in our Sunbasket meal kit was shipped under the Fish People Seafood brand and accompanied by the code I was able to enter at the Fish People website and learn more about the fishery. Unless I had already known the Australis story, I'll link to one of my articles about the company in the show notes, this piece of fish would have been a pretty faceless, generic piece of white flaky seafood, which is exactly what I, as a seafood consumer, am trying to avoid. It really seems to me that they have gone out of their way to not say this is a farmed fish. Absolutely, yeah. And even though the 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 farming of this fish is a is a pretty neat story it is and they do some they do do some some mariculture where you're actually farming in pens in the ocean and they also do they've done some really innovative cool work both in the states and in vietnam um with closed circuit um closed system <clears throat> so done entirely on land where nothing is getting kicked back into the the ocean um so they're doing some really neat things and they have a cool story um I don't know. I mean, my gut feeling is that, um, you know, Blue Apron marketing wise may be feeling like there's too much pushback against farm fish. So they want to de-emphasize that. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I don't know if it's fair to say it feels a little misleading. Yeah. It feels a little misleading. It does feel a little misleading. Um, and it is interesting that, I mean, this is the thing that we found throughout our research Mm -hmm. of these meal kit uh, companies, these milk kit delivery services, is that some of them really stake their claim. It's like going back to the GMO thing. Like some of them have really staked their claim on all wild. Some of them stake their claim on all farmed. There's yes. uh, and then you know as being like obviously all farmed is best, and then others being like no, all wild is best, and then some being like well, it's really complicated, um, and sort of walking people through the complication. But obviously, we know the consumer that might the, the person who might want to get the Blue Apron meal kit delivery service delivered to their door maybe doesn't maybe does or maybe doesn't want to engage in all that complexity. Well, I mean, if I, I don't know, maybe I'm generalizing. I feel like if you're ordering the meal kit service, maybe it's because your life is really busy and right. um, yeah, you just who's got time yeah. for all that. Right, that makes sense. And we do know, of course, that you know consumers, um, when it comes to seafood, are, are confused um, by all the different labeling schemes, by all the different choices out there in terms of what's sustainable and how sustainable it is. And um, you know, and, and there is a certain amount of consumer fatigue. And so maybe Blue Apron just doesn't want to even like go there. They just say up front, 100% sustainable seafood. They say on the back, listen, you know, we put we put our trust in Seafood Watch. 
Yep. They're great, which they are. They are. Um, and, and so, you know, trust us to trust them and let's get on with making an amazing meal yeah. and being excited about being in the kitchen learning to cook. And that's cool. It is, it is. And I- this issue of trust is one we'll touch on at the end of the show, but perhaps it's worth noting here that trust is not data. That may sound obvious to the point of being ridiculous, but I'm generally the type of person who really wants to see data to support a claim like 100% sustainable seafood. But before we get too far into the weeds on that front, let's get this bare Monday into Chef Max's able hands. I have not ever cooked barramundi before. Um, It looks a lot like slightly bigger bronzino. Look at that Mediterranean sea bass. Um, uh, And you know, it gives it gives a three to five minute cook time. Sounds about right. There's no oven required. I don't think they said on this. Yeah, it looks nice. Smells like melons, which fresh fish ought to smell like melons. Seeing Chef Max Miller with a recipe before him in the kitchen at the Landings Restaurant here in Rockland, Maine, is not a sight I would ever have imagined, but he's a good sport. Thankfully, as a chef, whom I would consider a thought leader in the local sustainable seafood space, Max gets it. Ironically, the task is, in many ways, far more daunting for Max than the extraordinary oyster toadfish dish he conceived and cooked in the last episode. So we're going to start this whole shenanigan of cooking from a recipe, which... Now I'm scared, I'm just gonna screw it up. <laughs> um, first step was starting rice. Water in a small pot. Pre-weighed rice in a small pot. Which, I, I gotta say that, um, I do feel like the timeline on this recipe is pretty, pretty tight to give the rice, which to them takes 12 to 14 minutes to start that. The tight timeline, not to mention all the reading involved, meant that we didn't have the space to get as philosophical about food as we often do. But Max did talk about seeing value in the meal kit approach because it has the potential to reconnect a generation that may have grown up on crockpot meals and microwave dinners to the art of cooking and all that comes with it. My father and I have had this conversation a number of times where I say, Dad, in your generation, because, you know, in the 60s is, is pretty much when this happened. What is it that happened? What do, you remember, what do you remember about your mother's cooking? And typically the answer is not a lot because it was a lot of lima beans out of a can going into, you know, a, the new invention of the microwave. He remembers seeing a microwave at the World's Fair, which to me is mind-blowing. <laughs> it's like a million years old in, in my perception. In addition to being a chef, Max is an angler, hunter, and forager. He knows, really knows, what it means to be connected to one's food. But a lot of other people are just discovering what that means. The desire to connect with the source of one's food is certainly not new, but it's something with which much of American society has lost touch in the persistent pursuit of making things easier. If you look up a lot of old advertisements for, let's say, an oven, it's always a woman, and it's always in an effort to make her life smoother or easier, or, you know, and at the time, most of these women were kind of just forced to be at home, and there there was more time, but we just shot for easy, shot for easy, shot for easy. And that is so clear and evident now in putting a bunch of mediocre at best products, canned lima beans, great example of mediocre at best, um, is stuff into a crock pot, overcooking the hell out of it because we were set on a timeline as opposed to that looks done. And it's really easy. That's, a re- that's like the biggest trick in cooking and it's the easiest thing, and we just glaze past it. If it looks so good that you can't not pick at it, then it's done. It's done. <laughs> it's like, that's over with. Um, but the, you know, the advent of just making everything easy, making everything easy, made us forget how to be people <laughs> in a large number of ways. And cooking is one, you know, a, I, for, I wish I remembered who it was. A chef was asked one time, what do you think the difference between people and animals is? And he said, very blatantly, is that we cook. And while we may, as a species, cook, 
There are a lot of us who don't scratch cook in our kitchens with our loved ones very much at all anymore. The results are likely a spectrum of societal ills ranging from obesity to apathy, which go far beyond the scope of this episode. At its core, however, cooking is a rekindling of a relationship between us and our food. And when we begin to know our food better, we have the opportunity to ask questions like, where did this fish originate? How was it caught? And the real zinger, what effects did my eating this fish have on me, on the people who harvested this fish, on the population of fish in general, and on the planet as a whole? In short, we begin to maybe care about sustainability in a way that transcends a word that through its ubiquitous usage has come to mean so little to so many. All right, so rice is going. I just added uh, hot water, which I should have measured. (laughs) <laughs> to the dry shita- shiitakes, half a cup of hot water. So I overdid that a little bit. Uh, they actually want you to reserve the water. So basically, anytime you steep dried mushrooms, you end up with tea at the end of it. It gives and it takes, which is kind of the blessing and the curse of using anything that you have to rehydrate is that you lose flavor in the hydration process. Um, a lot of times when I use dried mushrooms at the restaurant, I will either powder them and use them in a different way. I'll dust a piece of meat, or uh, we did a really nice porcini dusted um, tenderloin this season. Actually, you had that. Yeah, you had that with the pickled unripe apples and black trumpet mushrooms and carrot puree and ramp seeds, late summer ramp seeds, which I, that was a pretty cool thing to get from the forager. Um, but so the, in the, the recipe actually calls for this tea, which is a, a a brilliant lesson to learn about utilizing everything that you have around you. You know, taste everything when you're doing this. If you know you think it doesn't, you know, eat this cabbage. Try it raw. You should know what it tastes like. It's like the biggest thing you can do is build your muscle memory with with tasting things. Okay, what's the next step here? Peel and finally chop the ginger. Um, it doesn't specify this. Anybody that doesn't peel a lot of ginger at home, use the back of your knife. Don't use, don't mess up your blade for no reason. Or the back of a, the edge of a spoon works really, really well. But you lose less ginger. Like if you peel ginger with a, a vegetable peeler or just shave it off with the edge of your knife, your yield is going to be toast. Speaking of yields while preparing a meal kit got us onto the topic of waste, which I said I wasn't going to go into in any depth here. But I'm going to digress for just a moment because I think it's important to hear a chef's perspective both on the problem and its potential, and actually quite beautiful, solution. There is always waste in food. Um, Next to hospitals, restaurants are like probably two or three in the list of the most the 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 most waste uh, produced, and. one of the big things culturally in restaurants right now is to start cooking with the the shitty bits of stuff. Um, you know, and there's there's whole uh, you know some of the best chefs in the world have put out. I think it's Massimo Batoro has a dish um, that resembles this like murky, oily harbor, uh, and it's beautiful if you're looking at it the right way. It's astoundingly pretty. But the, the goal there was to produce something that resembled garbage out of garbage and like a, what a slap in the face that is if you're not willing to try this, you know? Um, which is kind of a, it's a beautiful thing. All right, so where are we at here? Thinly sliced cremini mushrooms. That can get taken the wrong way. Don't slice them. We're now gonna fast forward to the end of the recipe as Blue Apron tells us cooking the fish will only occupy the last five to eight minutes. Um, they did a nice thing for everybody by scoring the skin. You do need a little bit of a press. Fish is done. Taking it out of the pan so it doesn't keep cooking. Yeah. Almost there on the side. I gotta say, my side isn't as pretty as it was in the picture. I failed. Back to culinary school. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Take my blue apron from me. Um, but I mean, overall, this was pretty simple. Um, oh, I forgot about the seaweed. Oh my god. 
How could I have been so foolish? This is, this is pretty simple. And it took, what, 20 minutes? And I saved some time having good knife skills because I do this professionally where some time would be lost, but also as I don't professionally read. I, in fact, I, I don't even read non-professionally. That took me more time than it might take somebody that's used to going by a, by a set schedule. Once the dish is plated, we sit down at a table overlooking Rockland Harbor and taste the fruits of Max's labor. While it's no oyster toadfish that has been braised in lobster dashi and garnished with freshly foraged flowers, it's actually pretty good. Tastes like sea bass. It tastes just like bronzino to me, which is good. Again, that's a, it's a totally approachable, um, you know, the goal is, excuse me, the goal is to get more people to eat fish or learn how to cook fish so that the market of fish improves, um, which isn't necessarily these companies' goals, but it's certainly a tool on the way there. Um, if uh, you want to pick a fish that's, has all of these hot words attached to it, sustainable, chef picked, <laughs> whatever the case may be. But you also won't need to pick a flavor profile that's not, um, that's not uni. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not intense. Um, so the verdict? The blue apron barramundi and mixed mushrooms with jasmine rice and napa cabbage was good. It did what it needed to do, and with some basic tools and a modicum of skill, Max believes most anyone could be successful with this dish. And that's really important if meal kits are going to help more Americans cook and eat seafood at home. The National Fisheries Institute is the country's largest seafood trade association, representing upwards of 70% of the U.S. seafood community from water to table. I asked Gavin Gibbons, Vice President Communications for NFI, if he knew what the penetration of meal kit delivery services was into U.S. seafood markets. You know, I don't really have any um, sort of, uh, I don't have any statistics associated with that. Okay. Um, we, we haven't really tracked that. Um, but, you know, we do know that it is, a, um, you know, it, it's it's potentially an important market because one of the things associated with seafood is barriers to consumption. And one of the barriers to consumption is often preparation. And that's why you eat as much, uh, that's why Americans eat as much seafood as they do out of the home. So when it comes to something like a meal preparation kit, you know, being being able to um, sort of hold your hand and direct you uh, in how to simply and accurately prepare seafood, um, that certainly sounds like a good thing in terms of you know, knocking down a barrier to consumption, but we don't have any statistics on it. While there appear to be no publicly available data to which I can point at this time to show you that meal kit delivery services are causing more Americans to both cook and eat more seafood at home, the anecdotal evidence, combined with my own experience preparing some of the meal kit seafood recipes in both my own kitchen and with Max, suggests that these companies certainly have that potential. But what about sustainability? Eating more seafood is good, but it's best if that seafood is sustainable, right? As we've already discussed, sustainability is a pillar of many of the meal kit delivery services, but it's hard to point to any data that show just how sustainable the seafood these companies are sourcing actually is. Fish People's Ken Plass explains. Sustainability, unfortunately, is a bit like the word natural. It's come to be table stakes in many ways. I think if you went down the seafood aisle or retailer or um, any meal kit company, they're going to need to claim that their seafood is sustainable. And in seafood, there's so many regimes today. Um, and it's kind of a wild west of regimes that you can essentially, you know, and with the lack of regulation around it, uh, claim that your seafood is sustainable. Uh, I would say that the variability around how sustainable it is, is wide. Uh, but unfortunately, that's where we're at. I think what we... When Ken talks about regimes, he's talking about the plethora of certification, verification, assurance, and advisory schemes. Schemes like Seafood Watch and MSC. While most have good data to support their certification or advice, it's also true that each may have a different definition of sustainability. That's why Gavin says NFI advises businesses in the seafood space not to rely on just one scheme. I, I think that it is... 
it's it's reasonable to, for someone to say or to or for a meal kit company to say um, we source 100% sustainable seafood, um, and it and it happens to be that they are you know just dealing with one particular green list or just avoiding uh, seafood from one particular red list because you know there's a there's a great deal of, of effort that has gone into many of these lists in terms of determining what is green and what is red but we would rather that they not just use one list because then you, you get into a situation where you're sort of um, you know, you're not broadening your horizon and, and realizing that um, there are a lot of certification efforts out there um, that are not necessarily reflected in some of these lists. Um, if you look at something, for instance, like GSSI, which is the Global uh, Sustainable Seafood Initiative, you're, it's basically an effort to rank the certifiers. So if you're a meal delivery kit uh, company and you have just one list that you're dealing with, um, you know, you, you should probably start by looking at GSSI and saying, are there other lists that I should also be referring to um, before I make the determination as to whether this is a sustainable product or not? Um, and quite frankly, it could open up uh, their options. It really could. Tim Fitzgerald directs the Impact Division of the Environmental Defense Fund's Fisheries Solutions Center, and he agrees that partnering with Seafood Watch is a really good place for a company to start with its sustainability commitment. But he also thinks that companies can, and maybe even should, do more. Partnering with Seafood Watch and abiding by their standards, that, that, is, that is a really good sustainability commitment to start with. I think the other, the other piece of it which gets to the the kind of consumer confidence and the brand loyalty and all that stuff is just how you know how easy is it to find information on the website how transparent are they about where the fish is coming from and and who's catching it or farming it you know th- those sorts of things that just make you feel more knowledgeable and and better about the the products that they're sourcing and and the business that you are patronizing, essentially. Going beyond a third-party sustainability partner checkbox approach may be important because, as good as an advisory scheme like Seafood Watch is, it's still essentially a voluntary commitment insofar as Seafood Watch doesn't send auditors into the packing facilities of their business partners to ensure that they are not substituting an avoid species for a good alternative species. Ryan Bigelow is Seafood Watch Program Engagement Manager and oversees all the public-facing aspects of the Seafood Watch program, including its network of more than 125 conservation partner organizations. I asked Ryan about whether or not there is any oversight of a partner after they have gone through the fairly rigorous application process. That's a really good question. And the, the answer is, I, I would say not oversight per se. You know, whenever they add a new menu item or if they change a menu item, uh, we ask that they let us know so that we were able to, you know, compare that to our recommendations and see where that puts them in line with their agreement, their commitment rather. Um, but we are not policing the product per se. So for Seafood Watch, our difference, be- the difference between us and say the Marine Stewardship Council or the Aquaculture Storage Council or actual eco certification is we do not provide that element of traceability. What we say is if you are buying this product from this fishery caught in this way or at this location, it meets a, a seafood watch green or yellow or whatever it may be, um, or even a red for that matter. Um, however, if you're getting that product, is not, not something that we have the bandwidth to actually police. So to be clear to the consumer who may be more accustomed to using the Seafood Watch wallet cards or app to help guide his or her purchasing decisions at the point of sale, the Seafood Watch logo and language on a package that arrives in a meal kit has a very precise meaning. We're very careful about our language on any of these packages to say that we recommend this species if caught in this way in this location as this. And that company is saying that that that, that product is that thing, but we we don't get into that. Which brings me back to that piece of fish people labeled Pacific Cod that arrived in our Sunbasket meal kit, and which provided a traceability code on the packaging. Sunbasket, like Blue Apron, says on their website that they rely on two different schemes, Seafood Watch and the Marine Stewardship Council, or MSC. I called Sunbasket to confirm their sustainability policy, and I spoke with executive chef and co-founder Justine Kelly. 
I asked her about a phrase I'd seen on the Sunbasket website that read, quote, We believe food should taste good first and do good always, end quote. Justine explained to me that the company's founding is rooted in healthy eating and living, and that as a chef, her approach is what she calls, quote, ingredient driven. When it comes to doing good always, she says, it's really all about sourcing, and it goes well beyond checking a box. To me, I, I, you know, I've been in the restaurant industry for 30 years now, um, and the relationships with all of the producers is probably one of the most important things to me. Justine told me that Sunbasket is currently in the final stages of becoming a Seafood Watch business partner because they see the value in officially checking that box and having the logo and all it represents on their website. But Justine, like others with whom I've spoken, worries that sustainability is just a word that has, to a certain extent, lost its meaning. And that's really where doing good always comes into play. It's like how I feel about like calling something... Um you know, free range, like, what does that mean anymore? Right? Like, it actually doesn't mean anything. And if you, if you dig deep into like, you know, what the USDA considers free range, it's actually kind of part of my friend shitty, right? It's like, yeah. it's not, it's, it's not um, things like what something like do good always is that we do not want to greenwash anything, right? what I consider greenwashing um, and, or, and, and then paired with that is just trans- transparency. Hearing how central transparency and traceability are to the core values of the company and to Justine personally, I asked her a potentially challenging question I fully expected her to avoid. The one nagging issue to which my wife and I kept returning in regard to our overall very positive experience with the Sunbasket meal kit was why, of the three packages of seafood we received, only the Pacific Cod sourced from fish people had the traceability code on the packaging. While the other two seafood packages indicated sourcing information on the packaging, wild golf shrimp and wild Alaskan kita salmon, they lacked a story. I didn't get to see a picture of the boat or the fisher, and there wasn't any readily accessible information about the fishery. That all may sound trivial, but I would argue that it's really important in helping to connect people to their food and in encouraging them to care about sustainability. I was particularly curious why Sunbasket had not sourced the Kita salmon in their meal kit from Fish People, as I'd seen Kita salmon offered on the Fish People website. Having the same level of traceability on the Kita salmon as on the Pacific cod would have really been appealing to us. The whole salmon thing was a struggle for us this year. There, you know, there's Kita salmon from from various places and fisheries within Alaska. Um, uh, I'm st- we are still working with fish people to be able to to get the Yukon Kita um, to to get that back into our rotation. Uh, where we were um, at that time was that we we had to make a choice from a business perspective to source the Kita from from Bristol Bay area from a, another company which which we are very happy with and one of the things we're actually working with with all of our prote- protein um, suppliers we're starting with the protein suppliers and we actually want to do it as kind of across the board um, long term which is to get traceability information codes on all of our packaging. For the kind of consumer I am, what Justine just said is incredibly refreshing, and it makes Sunbasket the kind of company that would earn my business. For me, hearing about a level of transparency and traceability beyond just relying on a third party instills confidence, and with that confidence comes trust. I don't mean to suggest that the consumer considering a meal kit delivery service should begin from a place of distrust, But given how well poised meal kit delivery services are to promote sustainable seafood, I do want to see them go beyond the checkbox 100% sustainable seafood approach. And finally, in order for meal kit delivery services to excel as innovators and agitators in the seafood space, it's important for consumers to demand traceability. In a highly competitive space, where some companies may feel a lot of pressure to keep costs as low as possible, it's not unreasonable to assume that the sustainability bar may be the aspect of the meal delivery service that gets lowered first. After all, the meal kit delivery service that's going to keep you as a customer has to deliver when and where they say they are going to deliver. 
Sustainability, on the other hand, is a whole lot more squishy, especially when a company's definition of sustainability is an internal policy with little external transparency. In addition, there is the issue of not just lowering the sustainability bar, but still adhering to an internal policy. There is also the problem of outright fraud, where a company may use a less expensive and potentially unsustainable product, but call it something that's more expensive and sustainably sourced. And just to be clear, I'm not speaking in hypotheticals. A recent study by Tennessee State University found that 44% of randomly selected U.S. online purveyors of retail seafood shipped one or more mislabeled fish products to researchers as part of the study. It should be noted that the study did not look exclusively at meal kit delivery services, and that that 44% figure is actually pretty similar and possibly even on the low end of known seafood fraud in brick-and-mortar seafood retail. Which is why, Tim says, to a certain extent, it's always going to come down to some level of trust. If you were to go to a, a, you know, a Whole Foods or a Safeway or a, even a fish market, um, you, you have to put some degree of trust in, in the, the person or the business you're buying your fish from. Part of that trust comes from how transparent are they, how much information do they provide, how good of a story do they tell. Meal kit delivery services are likely here to stay, and that's probably going to be very good news for sustainable seafood, so long as consumers demand to both hear and take part in the stories that bring us closer to our food. Sustainability must always be seen as a journey, never a destination. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that these meal kit delivery services have the very real potential to be the new engine taking seafood in the right direction. In addition to my guests, special thanks to Vanessa Miller, who lent me her husband despite a whole lot going on in their lives. Music by Andy Cohen, and a big shout out to Clay Groves of the Fish Nerds Podcast, who continues to provide indispensable help with this podcast. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment about today's show, email me at ret at rettalbot.com. Leave a voicemail at 207-370-1575. That's 207-370-1575. Send a tweet to at Rhett Talbot or comment on the show's Facebook page which is facebook.com slash beyond data podcast. We'll follow up on your comments and questions in the next follow up Friday podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing on Apple podcasts, where you can also rate the podcast and post a review that really does make a difference. Thanks.